Hi, Beck. Welcome to the Soulful Podcast. Hi, Sam. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So I found you on Instagram, like so many other people who come out of the new age and are just passionate about creating content around the deception of new age beliefs. And then of course, um, finding Jesus, giving your whole heart to the real Jesus, which we can get into as well, because I think a lot of people, myself included, they were, they had the wrong idea of who Jesus is. Um, And so once you uh, connect to the Jesus of the Bible, Jesus is Mm -hmm. the living God, everything in your life changes, uh, which is so Mm -hmm. powerful. So how did you come about to just adopting uh, the new age beliefs and philosophies and ways of thinking? Yeah, um, I think like with most people that start dabbling in new age, it's a desire to heal. And I think that um, trauma is prevalent. I think mean, most people have experienced some form of trauma. Um, and so it's just this, it, it, it's the self-help kind of mentality and that can, it kind of snowballs from there. So I, um, I was actually raised Mormon And Mormonism and New Age share a few um, similarities. They're both works-based religion. Uh, They believe in a a pre-mortality and almost to an extent a reincarnation. New New Age certainly does. Um, But there's also, uh, yes, just just some things that just going from Mormonism then as an adult leading into New Age, I felt kind of safe, like there's things there that were familiar. So like I said, it was desire to heal. I had um, my family has a lot of fractures. Now now being a Christian, I can see that that was a lot of spiritual warfare. Um, and growing up, although we were devout members of the Mormon church, my mother still dabbled in, in occult things. So we would um, read our astrology every day. We would play around with tarot cards. We would talk to our ancestors, pray to our ancestors. Um, I would often see spirits from a very young age and my mother would encourage that um, and she would tell me that they were my ancestors visiting me or that they would look after me. She she and I, I love my mother and I think as a mother now I know that we do our best with our children and she was operating from what she thought, what she thought was good for me. Um, but she actually taught me that I should fear men over spirits and that the spiritual realm was not to be feared. So I really took that and I ran with that. (laughs) So then coming into adulthood, um, leaving the family home, I still kept dabbling in things like my mum would go see a medium. Um, We would watch like medium kind of shows together. And so I continued that. And that's where it started. It was reading my horoscope and visiting mediums because I could feel spirits around me. Um, I thought they were benevolent beings. I thought they were there to help, help me. I would talk to them. Um, and I would ask them for guidance and, and an altar to them. Um, I I honestly thought that they were my ancestors or deceased deceased loved ones um, or higher beings. So I got into um, Louise Hay, You Can Heal Your Life. So when I was around 19, I started to try to really delve into my childhood and unpack all this trauma and really got sucked into that kind of shadow work Um mother wound kind of thing I think you had a previous guest Eliza that was talking about that and I was like oh my gosh I know exactly what you're talking about I got really sucked into that and and I think um that's a normal thing that we want to heal and I really got got um if I can heal this now then I won't pass anything on to my children I mean I always knew I wanted to be a mother so that's where that desire came from Um, and much like Eliza um you can heal your life became my bible as well Mm. and so I really applied that That led into um, law of attraction and manifestation and visualisation. It was around the age of 20, maybe 21, there was a movie that came out called What the Bleep Do We Know? Are you familiar with that? It was a real, okay, so I went and saw this with my brother and this is where things accelerated. We met some people in that cinema and they went to this place called the Theosophical Society. Uh, the Theosophical Society sounded like a really nice place where people went to develop spiritual gifts. I now know that it's a completely occult um, organisation. It was founded by an occultist, so um, Helena Blavatsky founded the Theosophical Society. Um, I didn't know that at the time, but it was there that 
I was love bombed, completely love bombed. Oh, you're a healer. You're a light worker. You're an indigo. You're a star seed. You're all these things. And it made sense. All this loneliness I felt growing up, all this, like, I, I, I felt like I wasn't displaced almost. That, that hole in your heart that I know now was Jesus, I try to fill with all these um, different identities. And I really latched on to your healer. Um, so through the Theosophical Society, I started attending there every Saturday afternoon and they taught me how to see auras and how to read auras. They taught me how to do automatic writing um, and just the persistent love bombing of your special and you're here to help raise humanity's vibration. And now I can see that that was quite, uh, it, it gives you a real inflated sense of self, but I really thought I was helping people. And I try to make every time I, I talk about these things on my Instagram page, um, I always try to point out that people that do these things, just like I, they're deceived, but they genuinely think that they're helping. Their intention is so good. Um, so, yeah, that, that's where, where it really, and, and then the belief that I was a starseed indigo, you know, yeah. <laughs> just really. And so like, for, yeah. for those who don't know what a starseed mm. is, can you get into that? Because right. I actually had this belief as well at one point. Yes. So star children, so, so you, for, you've got the um, a special children, I guess. So there's a belief that... Um, so sometime around like the 70s, 80s, children started to come through from the cosmic realm into this world for the purpose of ushering in a new age uh, to help raise humanity's vibration. Uh, and they, they, these were children that were sensitive, spiritually gifted, um, maybe had some behavioural issues, but that's just because they were misunderstood and just didn't fit into this kind of world because they're, they're so much better than almost was the mentality. So my brother and I were introduced to that kind of concept and we really latched onto it because it just it just made so much sense for the way we both thought. We were both really attracted to um, things in the spiritual realm. Like my brother was obsessed with UFOs, so was I, like just things like that. And that's from there it started to go, well, maybe we're not from this planet. And that's where the star seed kind of comes into it. So these are children from another planet, uh, a higher, um, a higher dimensional place, a high vibrational place that have, you know, um, nobly come here to help save humanity. Mm -hmm. So it gives you that saviour complex um, and it also puts a burden on you. I felt, I remember there was many days where I felt really burdened, like I've got to try help everyone. And um, so there's along with the, so I identified as a starseed indigo. So uh, a, a child that was incarnated, incarnated here at a specific time as well as being from a different planet. Um, and then from there, I you, you get other children, so rainbow children and crystal children, and these are thought to be the children of. So indigo children would then have crystal children, which is what mm. I thought I had. I thought my daughter was a crystal. Mm. Um, but, yes, it's this belief that there are um, some special beings here um, from other planets mm. to help humanity. And yeah. it's wild how, of course, saying it now and yes. viewing those beliefs, it just seems mm -hmm. so like just nonsense, just yes. utter nonsense. Yes. Right. But yes. when you're in it, you truly believe that. And like you Absolutely. said, you really do have the best intentions and you mm -hmm. really begin to develop this complex and this sense of responsibility to help other people heal their trauma yeah. and to evolve and to mm -hmm. tune into their higher selves and all mm -hmm. of these um, terms that you hear in the new age. And mm -hmm. I felt that same responsibility. And I also experienced that whole love bomb atmosphere. I love yeah. the, the way that you said that because it yeah. makes you feel like you're in this cozy place and um, the endorphins are just ru running so high. And mm -hmm. uh, I remember going to retreat and there was a static dance and everyone's doing like the, these big hugs together and we're healing our trauma. And um, it's it truly is all about pumping you full of this, this new complex and giving you this ego, um, mm -hmm. so that you think you are better than other religions, the Bible, you, I mean, you have no interest in those things. No, no. It was a constantly a feeling of, I knew things that other people didn't know. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, that, I mean, that lie goes back to the garden in Genesis exactly. three, 
Um, I mean, all of this, all of this ties back to that. Um, but it's that that superiority superiority of um, I, I I've got like the special knowledge. Absolutely. Um, yeah. 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 So what were the main modalities of healing that you then entered into yeah. that you were teaching, practicing every day, yeah. really promoting the most? Yeah. So um, I loved your, your episodes on pick and mix. I, uh, that's so true. New age is a pick and mix. Um, and that is evidenced <laughs> by all the tattoos I have, which are just uh, a smorgasbord of just different ideologies and different, um, but, but, you know, now I can use them as, uh, as a talking point <laughs> with other people to kind of mm-hmm. show them, you know what, it's, um, it's, it's a pick and mix spirituality. Mm-hmm. Um, so the ones that I did from a very young age that continued as recently as the beginning of last year were praying to my ancestors, automatic writing. So that's a form of channeling, um, meditation, breath work, law of attraction, um, manifesting and vis- visualization. So I had my, my vision board. I had uh, an altar for my ancestors where that's where I would meditate. Those are the things that I did. Um, I mean, I, I guess looking back now, I could say I wasn't a very disciplined new age, but they would automatic writing was something I did weekly. The other things would kind of come in little waves here and there, but I always had a keen interest in all of it. And I told people about it and taught people how to do it. Someone came over, what's this? Oh, that's my altar. And then I would help them set up theirs, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, as I became a midwife, that's where things kind of took a bit of a turn into more healing kind of in, um, modalities. So um, midwifery and uh, new age are very, very closely entwined. Um, most midwives that I've ever worked with, uh, unless they're Christian, have, uh, and, and then even some, even then sometimes as well, um, lend to some mode of new age modality. And I, and I think from what I've observed, there is a reason for that. Midwifery is predominantly a female-led industry, so we're all women, and birth, of course, is an inherently female event. So what I observed um, over the 10 years I've been working in, in birth work is that it was unwell women looking after unwell women, women with trauma. And when we think about the one in three women experience some sort of sexual trauma, um, the third cause of leading death here in Australia is um is suicide so maternal death is suicide so we have got women who are looking after women during pregnancy but then also because pregnancy is such a vulnerable time identifying that hey that they, they actually need help they they've got this issue or that issue um then they would try to help heal them so for me that started a decade ago when i was a just starting out i was a student midwife and i was placed with a midwife for the entire year um, so in Australia, it's a it's a university degree, but the first year it's um it's great. You're you're basically in like an apprentice apprenticeship, and you just fingers crossed that you get a good midwife that will you know teach you well. And she was a lovely midwife, absolutely lovely. She was very new age, and so she took me under her wing. And that whole year of working with her, she told me again, much like I had at the Theosophical Society, that I was a healer, and that um. The universe had called me to this to this vocation and that I was going to really help women, not just with them birthing their babies, but birthing the new them, like the new, like that they would, you know, have breakthroughs through their trauma and all the rest of it. And she would often like, oh, you've got healing hands, you've got healing hands. And she was a Reiki master. And so over the course of that year, I studied Reiki with her as well. I think I did the level one. I think I got to level two, not master. Um, but she and it's through her that I started looking into just energy healing as a whole. That led into womb healing, learning about the divine feminine energy. So she would often talk about divine feminine energy and how we should harness it during pregnancy, birth, and postpartum. Um, and I would soak all this thing, these things up. Um, at the same time, being at university, it was a very feminist <laughs> um, mentality. Uh, as a bunch of women constantly being told that we had to smash the patriarchy. and um, Actually, looking back now, it's quite sad because a, a lot of the women that I went through university through, I, I truly believe we were brainwashed to an extent of um, having to fight these, the, the male patriarchy, the, the, the fear mongeries in the hospitals. 
that were usually male doctors and it was like us against them. And slowly over the course of a four-year degree, uh, many women, their marriages broke broke down um, with this real rise in feminism. And we, we were taught as well that we were the wise women, the sages, the witches. Um, I remember a guest lecturer coming to us and telling us that uh, the majority of the Salem witch trial um, witches were midwives and they were just, yeah. So that was really appealing to me as well. I mean, I never, I never called myself a witch, but I was, I thought that was in my blood, so to speak. I had all this ancestral wisdom. So that is deep in midwifery as well. This belief that um, you've been called to this vocation, that it's in your blood. Um, that moved into placenta kind of worship. Um, I truly believed that I was helping women when I would um, recommend that they do things with their placenta. I basically now realised that it was all forms of worship. But, um, yeah, those are the things that persisted. It was all the energy healing and the the Reiki, the crystal healing. Um, chakra balancing was another one that I did. And I constantly had a pendulum in my pocket, didn't make a decision without it. <laughs> So, um, yeah, when I came to Christ, I, I, I repented of so much, as you can imagine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. But, um, yeah, it's just all very entwined with, it, um, with birth work. It mm. is. And, um, you know, I chose a home birth. So yeah. that was, and of course, at the time, I was very much into the new age. And I uh, didn't, I wanted to say my placenta. I read about a lot of women who would bury their placenta and uh, give it as an like offering quote unquote to mother earth uh, for a successful birth. I chose Mm -hmm. to just um, have it encapsulated and Mm -hmm. just in case I wanted to try it. And when I did take it, uh, I know it affects everyone differently, but it made my milk supply like just go through the roof, like way too much. And so I only took it for maybe like a week or two and then I stopped. Um, Mm -hmm. But I know that, yeah, absolutely. Many women, um, they really Mm -hmm. see it as this sacred thing um, Mm -hmm. that they then give up as an offering. And so I think that really ties into my next question where a -hmm. lot of new age spirituality and even the birth work that you're referring to really is just witchcraft Mm -hmm. rebranded. And I think that this word is something that actually is becoming more and more prevalent in the new age. Like women are becoming more proud calling themselves witches. And so it's not so much taboo, like it used to be maybe 10 years ago. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. um, That's something I I was briefly on TikTok for like a week. (laughs) It's just too hectic. I got off, but that's one thing I noticed. um, Hashtag witches of TikTok. And I clicked on that and I was like, wow, these are millions and millions of women that identify with that label. Um, I, like I said, I never identified with that label, but I I truly believed that there were good witches and bad witches. And what I was doing, if someone was going to call it witchcraft, well, I was in the light. I was in the, the right side of witchcraft, if you could try to imagine that. But, you know, you... you that's the the false light deception that you think that you're healing and helping, but you're really actually just still in that darkness, um, along with the the witches that are doing more overtly occult things. But the realization that New Age was just witchcraft and rebranded um, was something I came across honestly probably about ten years ago, and I I scoffed. I was like, this that's ridiculous. Like this person that wrote this just obviously doesn't understand what New Age is because this isn't what it's about. Um, they were painting which is it's already dark and occult and I was like new age is all love and light I mean I would sign every email with love and light <laughs> like it was uh, it just didn't I the the um I was blinded to that I, I came across it it was put in my path I read this article and I was like this person doesn't know what they're talking about and I just I scoffed at it and I put it away um and then it was last year just before coming to Christ that that was you know revealed to me and um, I started, the, the thing is as well that I had looked into some of the origins of some of the new age and new thought kind of uh, people that I had been reading and some of them did have dark origins, but I chose to ignore it. I didn't, I didn't want to deal with that part of it. I just kind of would just gloss over that and go to the things that I thought were good. Um, um, we talked about Eden before about the lie there and, and new age just kind of, um, it's that same lie being perpetrated 
continuously. So we, we see that you can be like God, so that desire for hidden knowledge. Um, did God really say? And I think we see that today with biblical illiteracy, just not knowing. Um, and if you, you've never read the Bible, um, if, if, you, if you're a Christian and you're not, you don't read your Bible, um, things could surprise you. And if you're not a Christian, it, you would have no, no way of knowing that these things were actually um, the darkness that God talks about. Um, so, but what, what was put in my path, I, um, I had this like, you know, New Age is, I think I came across a YouTube video like randomly popped up, which happens to so many women. I just love that uh, it's the, these kind of media that is just kind of bringing women out of the New Age. But um, like many other women, it's just a random video popped up and it was talking about um, witchcraft and New Age and the ties between. Mm. And so from there I, I started reading and watching and then I started looking into, okay, what is Wicca and, and what do they say? They say do what you will. Okay, so what's occultism and what do they say? They say do what thou wilt. Okay, so what's the main mantra of New Age? It's follow your truth. And that was just that moment of it all just coming together. And I was like, it's all the same thing. They're all, they're all three is a deception trying to convince you that you don't need a saviour and that you only have to answer to yourself. It's, it's what you want and what you think um, so that there's, there's, no, there's no judgment because you're, you're it. You're the, the God of your reality. Um, so that, was a, that was a moment, a real um, true awakening moment when I realised that uh, it's, it's all the same thing. It's just packaged in a different way. Um, and in doing that, it appeals to a wide variety of people because we, we have people that are drawn to those dark things and then we have the, those that are drawn to the light. It's all the same thing, which is yeah. painful to realize. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I know it all comes from the kingdom of darkness. And um, yeah, and it's interesting, like you said, when you looked up that hashtag witches mm. and these women calling themselves white witches or just witches in general, they're doing energy healing, they're Reiki masters, they're doing yoga, they're cleansing their auras with sage and Palo Santo and doing astrology mm. and human design and all of these practices. And so you cannot ignore the fact that these practices are synonymous with uh, witchcraft, the occult, um, yeah. new thought. And like you said, go back to the original lie from mm -hmm. Eden that you too can be like God, that tree of knowledge is so beautiful mm -hmm. and from it, you'll gain wisdom. And that's what it's mm -hmm. all about. Um, and movies like the secret and now plant medicine, yes. people are, they're seeking this spiritual fulfillment and this wisdom and this secret knowledge outside of mm -hmm. themselves. And they're looking in all the wrong places and unfortunately getting trapped in new age from doing so. Yeah. And absolutely. so how, how did Jesus you just had stated, you know, you started to see the new age to Jesus uh, videos and testimonies come through. How did he really save you fully out of new age? Yeah. Um, you know, when I look back now, I can see that um, he was working on me for a few years. Um, I, even through all my new age, um, you know, things that I did, I always believed in God, the father, God, the father I prayed to every day as long as, as well as, you know, doing all the other stuff, but I also always believed in God. I didn't know who Jesus was. Um, growing up Mormon, I was taught that Jesus was Lucifer's brother and they don't believe in the Trinity. So I, I, and then going into new age, I thought Jesus was an ascended master. I had no idea he was God. I had no idea. Um, so about, well, 2020, um, I had been, I mean, everything going on in the world, um, was disturbing and I had been I'd always been the type of person that was seeking truth and that's why I have such a heart for those in the new age because I know ultimately that's what they're doing they're just trying to seek the truth um, and of course we know the truth is Jesus but I, I pray that they get there and the more they delve in that hopefully they will um, but I uh I was always one that would go down like rabbit holes. I just wanted to know why the world was so dark, like what was going on. Um, and it seems strange to say, but I believed in Satan before I believed in Jesus. And it, there was a moment in the kitchen, I was talking to my husband and I just had this overwhelming, it's like the words came out of my mouth and I couldn't stop it. And I just said to him, we need to get right with Jesus. And that's like, I just kept repeating to him, 
constantly. It was like uh, an, I, I couldn't control it. It would just come out of my mouth randomly. We need to get right with Jesus. He'd be like, where did that come from? We need to get right with Jesus. <laughs> so then that started and I kind of, you know, would say it and then it became a little bit of a um not that Jesus is a joke, but just a little bit of a joke between me and my husband because he would say, why do you keep saying that? I'm like, I can't help it. I don't know why, but I just, it's a real urgency I'm feeling. Mm. So that was most of 2020, but I didn't do anything about it. I didn't, I didn't go searching for him. I just kept going down rabbit holes. Um, 2021 came and I ended up leaving my job as a midwife. Um, I didn't want to work in the hospital anymore and I felt this real strong calling to homeschool my children just come back home. I had been a, a feminist or identified as a feminist for all of my marriage and it had put a strain on my marriage, like it really had been difficult. Um, and then raising girls, I was I was so adamant that I was going to raise them as feminists and I insisted that my husband do the same and I was just tired. <laughs> I remember saying to my husband one day, I just... I just want to be at home with you. I want the the marriage that our parents have. His parents are happily married. My parents are happily married, mm. and the mums were at home with the children. And I just really yearned for that. I was like, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, so twenty twenty one was trying to work through those kind of unpacking all that feminist ideology that I had. Um, and then I I left my job, and that that was painful to leave. It, it wasn't entirely my choice, but I felt that I couldn't stay. Just given the way things were operating, I didn't like how the hospital system was. Um, I didn't like the things that they were forcing on people. So I, I was just like, you know what, I don't, I'm, I'm going to step out. And maybe this is really good timing because that means it opens me up to be at home with my girls. So I pulled them out of school, started homeschooling. When I started homeschooling, I, of course, um, met a whole bunch of new people and they were all Christian. Um, <laughs> all, all Christian. And I kind of shied away. Um, but there was one, one friend, uh, that she, or actually I should say either all Christian or very, very new age. There's like no in between. <laughs> um, but I met this one mother who's now still a dear friend now. And she had tried, had been, she'd moved over here from another state and started homeschooling at the same time I did. And it was through conversations with her that I started to feel the urgency again of just wanting to know who Jesus is. So uh, she started talking um, to some of her Christian friends and asking a lot of questions and she would come back to me. And I remember one day in the park, we were sitting with our children and they were playing and, and she said, oh, you know, these, these group of ladies are so lovely that they're Christian. And we were both like, oh, it's such, that's such a shame. And there's kind of like silence for a while. And then we were like, why, why do we feel that way? Why do we feel that way? You could have told me they were anything else. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, cool. Why is it that we feel that way with Christianity? Um, so I went off and I started trying to unpack that. Like, why do I have this? And, you know, I could, I could, you know, put back to some church hurt that I experienced as a child in a, an organisation that that's, you know, um, doesn't represent the gospel correctly. So um, working through that um, and at the same time, my friend was going down the historical route looking for historical evidence of Jesus. So we would report back to each other about what we'd found. And then about, probably about a month later, she said to me, I feel like God's kind of calling me to him. And I was like, I feel the same way. Okay, what do we do with that? Um I, start, I think she started reading the Bible first and I went to YouTube and I started finding <laughs> that never popped up on my, my, you know, suggested things before, but all of a sudden it was all these new age to, to Jesus testimonies, like so many. And I binged so many new age to Jesus. And I, there were so many of them that were, honestly, it was like it was my story as well. And I started to realise what was my, that I had anger. I didn't realise I had anger towards towards God because I very naively and and foolishly was like why would you allow all this evil in the world I, I didn't I didn't understand that and I had a real mentality of why did all these bad things happen to me in my past how would you allow that and there was one um YouTube video in particular where a girl was basically saying the same thing it was a pastor kind of evangelizing to her and I think in it like a Denny's like a is that like a cafe kind yeah. of? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so 
she was in there and, and she was kind of saying a lot of the things that I'd been through and, and, and saying a lot of things that I thought and felt. And, and he just shared the gospel with her. He told her that, you know, God didn't want those things for, for you. Like you're his daughter and, and he loves you. Um, that, that, that was, that was men that did that. That wasn't, that wasn't him. Um, that one in particular, I was like, okay, okay, God, if, if I am yours, then like show me. <laughs> mm-hmm. And again, it was just repeated testimonies after testimony after testimony. And I'm very much a person who um, that was that was that makes sense as to why that was the me- the method that he kind of showed me. Um, started reading the Bible. Um, I started reading the Bible about October of last year, and the first week of October, I went and got my chakras balanced by an old colleague randomly ran into her and she was like oh you look really you know I I was fairly depressed at that Mm -hmm. stage in my life and she was like come by my house and I'm gonna I'm gonna heal we're gonna do a healing session so I was like okay you know still you know I hadn't gotten to certain parts of the bible so I didn't know (laughs) that these things weren't weren't good so I yeah I went to her house and I had many chakra balances with her before and this, this moment on the table, I was looking at this, like the, you know, the chakras on her wall. And I realized, I was like, oh, that's the rainbow, but it's upside down. So the colors of the rainbow, but it's upside down. And, and then that immediately the thought in my head was that that's satanic. It's inversion. It's inversion. God creates and Satan perverts. Mm-hmm. And this is another inversion. And, and because I had been down so many rabbit holes and looked at so much darkness in the world and got a little bit obsessed there for a moment with like like sim- symbology and stuff like mm-hmm. that, I recognised that. I was like, hey, hang on, what am I doing? And then just this strong urge, like, you've got to go home, keep reading your Bible. Mm-hmm. So I went home and I kept reading my Bible. That was the first week of October. By the end of October, so Halloween weekend, I had the biggest spiritual attack of my life. Mm. Um, I ended up um, being detained under the Mental Health Act and removed from my home and taken to hospital. And that now I see was like a last-ditch attempt to try. They didn't like what I was doing. I had a lot of familiar spirits that I had invited in. Um, I had always had a constant feeling of being watched. I would talk to these spirits. And I realised that month of October that they weren't my friends. And they turned on me <laughs> big time. Same thing happened um, to me. Yeah, wow. So that was that was like devastating for my family. It was just this moment of what this isn't a life I want to be in. Um, and I had read most of the New Testament by that stage and I just kept going back to John. John just kind of, uh, there were so many revelations, illuminations to me in that in that book. Um, the, the first one, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And I was like, Jesus is the word. Jesus is God. Oh, my gosh. And then, and then just honestly, the whole book, <laughs> the whole <laughs> book of John was just, oh, I, okay. Um, so I got home from the hospital the next day and I went straight to my Bible and I read through John again and again and again. And then by that Thursday, which was no, the start of November, I called uh, a Christian friend and I said, I, I need to come see you. And I just, I went to her house. I was like, I, I need to be, I want to follow Jesus. Like I, I've realized that he is what I've been looking for my entire life. Uh, and then I could just felt like all these moments looking back at my life. I was like, oh, he was there. He was there. He was there. Um, and yeah, so she kind of talked me through it. She shared the gospel with me again. I remember she asked me to kind of repeat and do you understand and, and do you really believe? And and so, yeah, that's when I started following. Jesus was um, the first week of November. Um, and, and yeah, it's been just completely life-changing since. Mm. Yeah. Oh, so powerful. And so after that um, spiritual attack you had right before mm. you fully committed to Christ, yeah. have you experienced or did you experience any spiritual attacks after that through the sanctification process? Yes, I certainly did. And um, this is something I always, I, I often have women um, in my DMs on my Instagram page um, that have just newly, newly left 
Um, and this is a, the main thing we talk about, really, because I, for most women, um, people I know that have left the new age and, and, and come to Christ, it, this is something that I kind of um, just be prepared for, that it, it's, it is likely to happen. Um, but for me, so November was a beautiful month. By December, because I had delved so much into Christianity, I wanted to understand everything. I had started going to a Bible study. I had just like was devouring the Bible. I just couldn't get enough of it and just watching sermon after sermon after sermon and all different types. And then December, just before Christmas, I got really confused. I got really, really confused because I started to realise that there were so many different denominations and different um, interpretations and different, um, you know, uh, different doctrines, different, just differences. And I got angry <laughs> because I felt like I'd found the truth and then all of a sudden it, we had people, you know, and, and I had um, someone say to me, oh, uh, all Baptists hate all Pentecostals. And I was like, what? I mean, that was a, quite a sweeping statement by that person. It's not what I've found in my experience. Right. But um, that really got me thinking. I was like, what do you mean? We are all just love Jesus. Like what's... What's the, what, so that took a, a little while to reconcile all that in my mind. Um, and then also from there understanding well, what's the main, the, the, you know, the thing that we should all agree on as a Christian is the gospel, is that, it, that in the Trinity that, that he died for our, our sins, that he was raised on the third day, um, that he is God. So that was, but through that time of confusion, I had uh, just a lot of um issues with like sin I had always had a problem with um with drugs and alcohol throughout my life mainly in my in my 20s um I, and I I didn't really realize how much of an addict I was until oh, probably you know December <laughs> last December really the the realization because I was like well I I I'm functioning I I have all these achievements do you know what I mean mm-hmm. but but no really I was using from Thursday to Sunday and then drinking every other day as well. So I, I did have a problem and it took me a while to realise that. But that that December, that that really ramped up, that kind of reared up again and I started to have thoughts that I wasn't worthy of God and, and um, I was too broken and I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't be fixed. And I, I, I realised now I needed deliverance because that's what I prayed for. Um, if I'd known of deliverance ministry and, and I had, you know, there's some deliverance ministry that I don't particularly align with but um, I think real uh, deliverance ministry with strong discipleship afterwards I think is also key Um, I didn't really have that I prayed I prayed it was a Friday night in my in one of the rooms in my house and my family was sleeping and I realized that this problem um, was bigger than I could deal with and I just laid it all at his feet and I literally felt something pop and release like in my mind it was like um I had 20 years of programming in my mind that there was like things I would repeat in my mind all the time like I can't get the day through the day without it you won't be able to sleep without this you need to have another drink for this like you need it you know what I mean um and it was gone it was like that tape in my head was just completely erased and I that was it. <laughs> wow. That was the end of it. Um, there was no, and for someone at, at that stage, my my two kind of things that I used was daily daily use of alcohol and marijuana, and that's so for my husband to witness that as as I felt a lot of shame about it. I was like, do I want to talk about that? But I do because it is. Mm-hmm. I am a living it is a living testament of the goodness and grace of Jesus. And the, the most important person I want to see that is my husband. Mm-hmm. So he has witnessed that. He thought that day would never come. He, I remember when we got married and I was like, I'm going to be like this forever. <laughs> and he was okay with that, yeah. <laughs> but he wasn't really, you know, he right. wasn't really. And yeah. um, so that is just, I just love that he has gotten to witness that. Mm-hmm. And that, that that's, that's a, he, he said himself, that was a miracle that he's witnessed. So Amen. that is, yeah. 
Wow. Yeah. And that it is, it's a true testament to the power and the mercy of God. Like what mm -hmm. a good, good father he is. And he truly yes. does want the best for us. And when we go to him with our whole heart in prayer, with a request, when we know we can't do something by our own strength, he will deliver us. And yeah. um, so much of what we fight is spiritual. And of course the enemy wants to keep us bound to our addictions um, and to sin. And uh, through his grace, he can, he can save and redeem us. And and yeah. that's just such a powerful story that it can happen that quickly. It can happen yes. in an instant. It doesn't have to take yes. 20 years of quote unquote healing, like trying to heal in the new age in order to overcome mm. something. Um, yes. And it's just so powerful. Yeah, uh, that was, yeah, that was amazing. I still, I think like, I think about that night a lot, just that overwhelming love that I felt, um, that feeling of like, oh, he sees me. He sees me. Like that's just, yeah, amazing. I mean, there was other things from that as well. I mean, I, I've had sleep paralysis my entire life. Um, I, interestingly, I, I stopped and I, and I started getting sleep paralysis as a small child and it was quite a normal occurrence in my family. Um, so my mum would tell me to say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to leave. Um, but I was never able to get the words out. Mm. It really amped up in my 20s because I was doing a lot of automatic writing and inviting these entities in. Um, and the, the most horrible experience of sleep paralysis happened when I was living in an apartment by myself. And it was, yeah, a really prolonged attack. Um, for those that don't know, sleep paralysis is just that feeling of being pinned down. Um, sometimes it's accompanied by like a, for me, and it was accompanied by like a growling noise in my ear. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it was one entity, sometimes two, but there's one time in my, that apartment, there was probably about eight. When I met my husband and I got married, it stopped. Didn't have it. Came back the, the day I shared my testimony at church. <laughs> that night I had sleep paralysis mm. and it honestly just kind of made me laugh <laughs> because yeah. I thought, yeah, okay, I'm doing something that, that the enemy doesn't like. Um, and I could quickly rebuke it using Jesus's name. I, I got the name out. Um, I, I, I did manage to get it out once um, when I was probably a teenager and nothing happened. And I've been asked about that. Like I strongly believe in the, the power of it in Jesus's name. Um, and everyone I know that, that has had sleep paralysis, they have the same thing. When they say his name, it stops. Mm -hmm. um, there's one time I did manage to say it. Um, it may have been inaudible. But I also think uh, we see an example of this in um, Acts, Acts 19, I think it is, or Acts 13. Um, I can't remember now. It's in Acts where these Jewish sorcerers are using Jesus' name to try get a demon out and it's not, it's not working and it's because mm -hmm. they don't know him and they don't know who he is. They're using mm -hmm. his name as, a, as like a talisman, like a magical something that they can use. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it, might, it may have been that. I thought Jesus was Lucifer's brother. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know who he was God. But, yes, the sleep paralysis happened the day I gave my, my testimony and a few times since. But, um, yeah, I don't fear it the way I did before and I can rebuke it. Yeah, and I experienced mm -hmm. not the sleep paralysis, but it was right after I – uh, renounced all things new age, started sharing testimonies like I am here mm. on the podcast mm. that um, I started experiencing attacks in the night. So I'd, you know, wake up, feel a presence of something really dark right there um, at my yeah. bedside and just fear, have this fear in my heart um, and then have to repeat the name of Jesus until it just completely disappeared. Yeah. Um, but the the nightmares and the night attacks, that's something that the, it's one of the most prevalent forms of spiritual attack that most people mm -hmm. will experience, even believers. So you don't have to necessarily, yes. you know, have a demon um, yes. to be attacked. He can attack yeah. any one. And um, I really believe that he knows he can't have our souls. And especially if we're living in the light of uh, the gospel and trying to promote all of these things that it's just natural. We're going to come against those attacks within our yeah. journey. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And that was actually um, good for my husband to see as well, because he was like, well, why is this happening? And I, and I explained just that to him. I was like, well, now it says in the Bible, we're going to, we're going to be, um, you know, persecuted. We're going to be targeted 
just for his name's sake. And, and I think that's the difference now that I just think, oh, I, I see what you're doing <laughs> and I see it's because I am following someone you don't want me to follow. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, it, and, and, and it just kind of confirms like I belong to Jesus. So. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah. I was telling my husband, it's so hilarious that when you're in the new age, you see all of these um, entities and people are seeing aliens and there are these beautiful mm. light beings. And then right yeah. when you get out of the new age and realize that mm. that's all false and it's all coming from the enemy the yeah. the little minions of the devil they're like okay the gigs up and the claws yeah. come out and the mask comes off and they don't care anymore because they know yeah. that you know who they truly are yeah. and um yeah it's just so apparent and then of course we don't give any power to that we know that in the name of jesus and through his blood we have been saved and um we are protected uh through the holy spirit and so we can always come against that using his name and we don't have to fear it, which is um, so incredible. Yeah, it totally is. Yeah. And so going back a little bit to the womb healing, um, mm. these different practices that you're seeing emerge in midwifery that are becoming yeah. more and more new age. Can you just point out maybe a few of them for those who yeah. don't? fully understand some of these practices that are now creeping into midwifery yeah. because it's also, I really believe becoming common for even Christians to, you know, hire a doula, have them come into the hospital. Um, what do some of these practices look like that we need to watch out for? Yeah. So uh, look, honestly, there's, uh, there's a big list, but then I'm going to focus on three in particular. Um, but so there's a lot of within birth work and you'll find this with, with doulas, with um, birth educators, with um, traditional birth attendants, midwives, uh, there is some some new age things that are often talked about, uh, things like spirit babies, conscious conception, guided meditations, a lot of self-love, self-care, self-healing, or like I, I call the doctrine of self kind of talk. Um, we see lots of pregnancy and mum and bub yoga. That's very popular. Uh, this amongst midwives and birth workers is this ancestral wisdom, this um, idea that it flows in our blood. Um, so we will, well, midwives I know would often talk to their ancestors for like guidance, like say if there was something going awry. Um, Pain-free is a big one that's going around now. And that really leads, in, leads, in, leads into law of attraction and um, uh, manifesting word of faith as well, are all kind of entwined in that kind of pain-free. I would even kind of say that's a form of prosperity gospel as well in with that. Um, mother blessings, mother wounds, shadow work. I remember telling so many pregnant women, like, this is the perfect time to, to deal with your mother wound and do your shadow work before your baby comes. So there's lots of that. Self affirmations. And I, I think affirmations are really helpful in um, pregnancy, labor, and birth and postpartum. Um, but it's how we affirm things so that the self affirmations are all about you and your power. So it goes into the gospel of self kind of doctrine as opposed to more biblical affirmations of God's grace and God's power and you birthing with him through the strength that he gives you. So we see a lot of uh, co-creation kind of mentality that our women are goddesses, divine feminine energy, a lot of esoteric titles used among birth workers like womb alchemists, sages, wise women, shamans, um, they're like birth shamans, uh, lots of energy work, lots of circles, uh, moon worship, uh, chakra balancing, lots of superstitions and beliefs around the the call, so the on um, on call that cut the sack that covers the baby. Um, so lots of stuff like that. I remember having a midwife telling me all these kind of stories, and, and yeah, that flows in our blood kind of mentality. But the three main ones that I see are womb worship, which kind of ties in with placenta worship, and hypnosis. So womb worship is. I just want to differentiate it from womb healing. Mm -hmm. I think womb, womb healing can be a separate thing, much like we can have herbal remedies. Not all herbalists are witches. Many may identify as that, call themselves a plant witch, for example. It's the same in um, womb, like fertility and birth circles. We see a lot of um, healing things. So like things like castor oil packs, herbal tinctures, uh, yoni steaming, those in and of itself um, I would put in like a healing thing. 
but that word healing can also be interchanged with womb worship. So it's always really good to define terms with anyone that you're engaging in care with. Uh, when they say, should we do some womb healing? Just ask, what what do you mean by that? If it's just a, a, a tincture or, or something um, that they think is going to help your hormone ba um, balancing that I would put in that thing, that's fine. But when we, when we move into things like saying that the womb is a portal um, or the womb is something that uh, holds and releases trauma that we can then give back to Mother Earth, um, then we're moving into a different kind of um, a different kind of ideology that, as Christians, we 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 don't need to delve into. Uh, these are kind of things like real creator creatrix kind of mentality, like that that women create in their own power. Um, so it's essentially saying that we are equal than or greater than God. Uh, womb worship kind of goes along this idea of a great mother or a cosmic mother. So at the core belief of um, womb worship is that God didn't create, rather God and everything else was birthed through a cosmic mother, like a cosmic kind of being, mm -hmm. which of course is completely unbiblical, um, but it's very, it's it's super prevalent in fertility and birth, birth work. It's so intertwined. And it's um, so mainstream now. It, it's 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 everywhere. So um, and because the the language is really lovely, and it's um, we're just trying to heal, and we're just releasing trauma, then it can sound it can sound fine. I, I've I've come across some pages that that speak this language, but they also include scripture in with it, and I think that can be really confusing um, for many women. Because if you don't know that language, then it can sound like it could be really helpful. Um, so defining terms is always a really good idea. Um, and so, of course, the, the, the womb worship is, like with most things in the New Age, it puts the onus on and power on you to heal yourself, to heal your womb, to connect with the source kind of wisdom through your womb. Um, the other two that I see really um, massively in birth work and things that I used to promote really heavily uh, that shortly after being saved, I wanted to start, like many of us do, wanted to start our, uh, our Instagram page, um, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, it was my page originally started as a, um, I wasn't working as a midwife, so I thought I, I could help women with like mother crafting, like learning how to look after a newborn, and that's what my page was going to be about. And I did a couple of posts and then I just, I remember one night I had, I had prepared like a post or something and then all of a sudden I was like, you need to look into what the Bible says about placenta. Mm. And I was like, what? I don't recall reading. I had read the New Testament by then, but I went back to the Old Testament. I think actually I was on my Bible, like an app on my phone, and so I just looked up placenta and I found the one passage where it talks about, and I always when I bring this passage up to women, um, like fellow Christians, I, I sometimes get, uh, oh, that's just one verse. Like, But for me, I think it's the inerrant word of God. I think everything is in there for a really good reason. Mm -hmm. um, and if nothing else, if I, I think the hypnosis and placenta worship are the two things that I get most kind of pushed back on um, because people don't, not all people see it the way I see it. And I totally, mm -hmm. I totally understand that. Um, but I would just ask that you just, you know, prayerfully consider what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So the, the the verse that I read to do with the placenta is uh, Deuteronomy, I think it's 28, uh, 2857, and it describes the mother eating her baby and the afterbirth. And it describes it in a really, uh, it was a shameful secret act that she entered into because of a curse. Mm. and I just thought is that something that we as Christian mothers want to be replicating whatever you think and, and I'd already started to realize that all the things I told women about their placenta were incorrect uh, there's a lot of lies that have been told um, about that the placenta will uh, like there's hard evidence that it will reduce your postnatal depression or it will um, you know do certain things for you postpartum there's actually no journal articles to support that, but there, but I will acknowledge there is a lot of anecdotal evidence. Mm -hmm. um, so we can't we can't ignore that. I, I do I do acknowledge that, um, but I just kept coming back to this verse, 
And then in, um, and I started thinking about all the women that I told to consume their placenta. I, I told every woman I looked after, after um, that this was a good, good idea. Um, and then I, I kind of really had to really stop and think about, well, what else did I think about the placenta? What else was I promoting? And I really promoted the idea that the, the placenta was this special spiritual life force. Um, so things I advocated for just, just fed into that. So uh, placenta art is I would always offer the couple after after the birth, do you want me to make a print out of your placenta? And that's, it's, it's blood art. Um, and blood art has occult, occult origins. Um, the other thing I, I didn't offer myself but I would tell the women I cared for about was that they could get a placenta reading. So you could send uh, a print or an image of your placenta and the placenta was, was thought to be wise and could tell you things about your child. So, you know, it's, it's that kind of psychic abilities, I guess you would say. Mm. Um, so it was kind of looking at the placenta as if it's something that can heal us, that can guide us. And I, I realised for, for myself personally that I was put in the creation above the creator. Um, granted, I wasn't in Christ then, but then I had a real heavy, like just burden almost on my heart just to tell other women about this and just say, look, I, I, I feel that I was wrong in doing that and these are the reasons why. Um, moving more into the Bible, I started looking at, okay, well, what do we know about uh, consuming blood? Um, because one of the things I used to offer was um, placenta smoothies. I would offer to make them for the mother postpartum. I would tell the husband how to prepare it. I, I actually also learned how to encapsulate placentas. Um, that's that's a, a, a something I've gotten on my page when I've talked about this before was that, you know, I am potentially harming a lot of women that have this as a business. And I really empathise with that. And I would also say that I myself was about to set myself up in a business of encapsulating placentas. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't, but I, I get that. And I, I, I'm sympathetic towards that, but I still don't think that's a good enough reason. If you know, and if you're convicted and, and you've read the Bible and you, you, you know, believe that, then um, that's not a good enough reason really to, to continue it. So I, yes, yeah, so I was talking about that on this little page that was supposed to be just about how to look after your baby. <laughs> and all of a sudden I was like, don't eat your blood uh -huh. Um, So, yeah. But then the other thing was, um, but, yeah, sorry, what else about the placenta? Yeah, so reading, art, and the lotus birth as well. Um, mm -hmm. They're all kind of, and consuming the blood. So I found in Acts, um, I, I talked about how the Old Testament talks about abstaining from blood, and then I had someone say, well, the Old Testament doesn't apply. And I was like, well, it's still a moral compass for us all. Yeah. And we still have the Ten Commandments, and mm -hmm. it's all, we can't we can't throw out half of the Bible, like, you know, mm -hmm. it's important. If it's important enough yeah. for God to put it in there, then we need to take heed of it. Yeah. But there's also in the New Testament, Acts 15, 29 talks about um, abstaining from consuming blood. And like we know, only Jesus' blood, heal, blood heals. Mm -hmm. So it's not the blood the placenta that's going to have some sort of healing um, properties on you or your baby. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, another lie that I used to, I believed and I told about the placenta was that it was a, lots of cultures do it and that, you know, um, that it had no consequence as well. So the the belief that lots of cultures do it is, is isn't true. Um, I was told that verbally from other midwives, and I, I ran with it. Um, but there's actually no evidence to suggest that the a, um, traditional Chinese medicine does use placentas, um, but they don't give it to the mother. They use it for other people, like they make things from the placenta. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of a difference there. But the biggest thing that ancient cultures used to do with the placenta was to bury it. They'd have burial kind of ceremonies with it. They weren't consuming it. So that was a bit of a lie that I, I actually perpetrated and told many women that, um, mm. oh, our ancestors did it, and that, that's not true. The other thing is that it um, that there's no bad side effects from it, and that's not entirely true as well. I've had so many women in my DMs that were like, it made me really sick, I got an infection from this, and and then I was like, well, that makes sense because it it functions as a filter to, to screen out toxins. So that that makes sense to me. That And the body expels it. Like uh -huh. the body, it's done with it, we expel it. So that also makes sense to me that it's a, uh, at that point, it's 
it's obviously vital when the um, baby's in the womb, but once it's expelled from the body, the body, it's now a waste product. So that was all of that kind of came together. And I was like, what have I done? Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, um, you can only just kind of try to educate other women and just hope that they have ears to hear. Um, the other big one that I get a lot of pushback from and, and also a lot of um, women agreeing with me is hypnosis. And my issue with hypnosis is that it has roots in gnosis and, and spiritual darkness. And there's no negating that. There's no saying that it doesn't. Um, I have a lot of people say, well, it worked for me. So what's the big deal? And, and, and to that, I would reply, well, I'm not debating its efficacy. I've seen it in action. I used to be a hypnobirth practitioner. I, I used to teach this. And I could see that it did work, um, but that doesn't mean that it's for that that's something we should be doing, and it's it's not for everyone either. Um, and we 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 shouldn't put our experiences above wanting to follow the word of God. So I I again that was another realization uh, late at night on my couch. <laughs> I'm going to talk about hypnosis now. What have I done? Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I started looking into it. I was like, well, I, I taught this quite blindly. Uh, what, where did it come from? What, who, what, who, when, why? So I started looking at the history of hypnosis, and it was originally um, always viewed as an occult practice. It was done by shamans, by yogis, by witch doctors and other people like that. Um, and it was popularised and really brought into like the healthcare kind of setting by a physician called Franz Mesmer, and it's from him we get the word mesmerised. Mm. And so he was a doctor, he was an astrologer, an occultist, and he advocated for its use in, um, in modern healthcare. Um, and so his work really led to two, two movements. So uh, it kind of gave birth to the new, new thought and mind science kind of um, thing so where we get like Christian science from mm -hmm. and he also from his work and popularizing a hypnosis uh, birthed a movement called spiritism so this was like mediumship and lots of seances and stuff like that kind of emerged from his kind of goings on um, so the common lies that women are told about hypnosis is that no it's not an occult practice it doesn't have occult roots but anyone that will look into it will see that it does um, another lie is that it's a naturally occurring state. And this is something I used to teach as well. I would say it's kind of like when you're driving home and you get into your driveway and you think, how did I get here? That's what, that's what it is. It's, it's not, it happens to us all the time. It's like a daydream, um, but, it, but it's not. It is an induced state. Mm -hmm. um, and the other lie was that it doesn't allow for any outside suggestion um, or influence. And in my experience of watching women use uh, hypnobirthing, um, most would go into what I would call a, a, there's levels. So level one, two, three. So level one would be just a really relaxed state. Some, not all, I'd say probably maybe 20% would go a bit deeper into um, level two, which they would be, we could easily um, influence, influence them. Mm. So that would be my point. Just because you you may have had just a relaxed experience, but you felt very with it still. That that's your experience, but it's not like that for everyone. Mm -hmm. Other people do have a deeper kind of um, experience with it. The other thing with hypnosis is um, when I look at like back at the hypnobirthing uh, kind of um, classes that I taught. A lot of it was just what you'd find in a, just a good birth education class, a class that taught physiology, um, that taught you how the hormones were at play together, that, that taught you about movement in birth. And so a lot of hypnosis courses just teach really, really good birth ph physiology mm. and then women go through it and give all the accolades to the hypnosis. And I'm like, well, mm. well no, you were just educated and when we have good education on birth physiology, we have a naturally occurring state that God designed us to have. Um, the two main ones, like when all the hormones are working perfectly and when we facilitate a really beautiful birthing space, then the um, we actually have a change in brain activity. 
Um, so in that way, I think that hypnosis for birth is a little bit of a counterfeit to something that God has originally designed, and that is the diminishing of the prefrontal cortex. Mm. And when we have a really good um, facilitation of physiological birth, that will happen, and that renders uh, a woman in like this kind of in-between state of, yes, we're still going to feel the contraction, and then the next contraction will come, but in the in-between, you just you just are. That's how women would describe it to me. And, and that's the experience I had as well in, in my second birth. Um, and that's the way God designed it to be. So I get frustrated sometimes because I'm like, you're giving the accolade to an occult practice when mm-hmm. really God has outlined a perfect kind of, um, yeah, physiology for you to have a, a, the true experience rather Absolutely. than the counterfeit. Yeah, and I never did hypnobirthing. I definitely looked into yeah. it, but um, I can absolutely attest to what you're saying. Like just naturally yeah. going in and out of the contractions, yeah. you already feel like you're in another dimension. You feel like yes. just you know, you're, it's it. It's so hard to describe, um, yeah. but it is very much this type of out of body experience. Um, and there is no need to alter your state of consciousness no. in the Bible, stay sober, stay vigilant yes. for the enemy is roaring like a lion looking lion. for someone yep. to devour. And so that brings that's me right. into my next question in regards to breath work, because this is something that's mm. also wildly popular in birth, in labor. Um, a lot of people, they get confused with the different types of breath work, mm. um, but any mm-hmm. type of breath work that is inducing an altered state of consciousness, where you are feeling as though that you're on this plant medicine experience, you've just taken psychedelics, that is not something that is biblical. Um, and yeah. so can you get into that a little bit as well? Yeah. Um, so I get I get this question a lot um, about, well, what is breath work and what are breathing, like what's the difference between breath work and breathing techniques for labour? And um, I think the biggest difference is, is breath work is, is it's really a dedicated spiritual practice. And breathing techniques for labour is something that you use just in that moment. It's not a spiritual practice. So um, breath work, as you know, has roots in Eastern philosophy. It's, a, it's um, and it often incorporates other modalities. So when I would do breath work, I would also have my sound bowl and I would be burning some sage and I would be other things incorporated into the practice. And the goal was to, to alter your consciousness, to alter your state of mind. Um, we see breath work in, you know, um, Taoism. I think I'm saying that right. Yeah. It's Taoism. Um, obviously in, a lot in yoga. Um, and other shamanic kind of cultures and stuff like that. And the idea with breath work is that we're trying to heal a trauma or clear an energy blockage. Um, what what disturbs me about breath work is the manifestations that you see at what is regarded as a successful session. So the writhing and the screaming and the what I now see with new eyes, serpent-like manifestation, um, which I was just like, how was I blind to this <laughs> for so long? Why wasn't I seen that? And I would watch these, um, wow, that, that was such a good breakthrough. They had such a good healing session. I think that that was so amazing. And now when I, I watch stuff like that as well, it's, it's just so obviously not of God. And I just, yeah. Um, so bre- breathing techniques for labor, on the other hand, uh, like I said, they're just used in that moment to refocus you, um, either between contractions, they're used for that moment. And it's to refocus on a conscious level rather than alter on a subconscious level. And so I get a lot of women like, oh, my, my midwife wants to teach me breathing, like wants me to do bre- breathing for labor. And I'm like, yeah, that, 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 that's okay. It's always a good idea to define your terms, um, like with, with anything, what kind of breathing is this just techniques um but it's like we see when people have uh, uh overly stressed or having a panic attack it, we all naturally need to focus on our breath again um we you know so this can be used in many different settings and that when it's just in that moment and a, a refocusing then that is vastly different to um you know trying to alter alter your state um yeah i think breath work is just a real it's a it's a perversion of truth. Like if when we think that God gave us His breath of life, and then in breath work we see that that breath of life being manipulated and made into an idol for ourselves, 
I think that's that's quite a perversion. Um, yeah, but yeah, very different to just yeah. It yeah. is. It's becoming. I am the healer. I'm self healing, mm. quote unquote. Um, so yeah. taking uh, the reliance off of God. And yeah. then just like you said, all these manifestations, people going into a paralyzed state, people having yeah. panic attacks, people blacking yeah. out. Um, there are testimonies of people dying from this. And I know this because I was triple certified as a conscious wow. breathwork teacher. Um, yeah. And so these were all things that we were warned about in our trainings and um, then seeing people um, within the trainings, puking, slapping themselves, screaming, yeah. ripping clothes off, yeah. speaking in a light language, talking mm. about going into a past life, um, becoming a shaman, uh, seeing uh, light beings. None of mm. that is biblical. That is all of the enemy. That is all, yeah. like you just said, a perversion of what God yeah. meant for good. And it's a yeah. huge counterfeit. And I can't wait. I'll be doing an episode soon, breaking down the occult origins of uh, breath yeah. work. And um, just like you said, it is a spiritual practice mm. per breathing, taking a deep breath before yeah. you're stretching in labor at a moment when you're stressed before you go into prayer or worship, just to actually recenter yourself in your body. And, mm -hmm. um, absolutely. It's a powerful tool to help us reduce stress, but not used in a way where we should be altering our state of consciousness and going into, uh, like I had said before, a psychedelic like experience that mm -hmm. is not mm -hmm. biblical. And it's something, yeah. unfortunately that, um, is becoming, more and more uh, popular and yeah. many Christians are falling into the trap, just like I did, that this is okay. And it's not. Yeah. 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 I often get that because it, there's just this uh, idea, well, God gave us breath. So, you know, I, I, I get that a lot. Yeah. Oh yeah. Same. Yeah. I see that in the DMs, people <laughs> sending me stuff. And like, I, yeah. like we've been talking about everything that um, is in the Bible the enemy tries to copy. And so it's just another yes. version of that, just like yes. the, ra the rainbow. Uh, it's yes. his way of taking that and then using it for his purposes yes. and to make uh, people uh, feel okay, not relying on God, no longer reading the Bible, becoming their quote unquote own healer that they don't need God. They can just, and people get addicted to those, that, um, that state of being, they a feeling high. So you do get high off yeah. your own breath. It's a very addicting experience for many people. People are craving spirituality. And so when you have a, a psychedelic like experience, another dimension, mm -hmm. just by altering your state of breath, that becomes yeah. something that's, that people go to again and again and again, and they don't realize it becomes like a drug. Um, mm -hmm. and it's a very sticky trap. So now what do you recommend to clients during labor? Besides yeah. heat breathing, what are some of your go yeah. tools? I would love to hear that. Well, I, I think um, the, the main one would be uh, to surrender it all to God. Um, there's this there's this mentality that we need to be in control of it all. And I, I absolutely agree that you need to be prepared and prayerful and support physiology. Um, so that's getting surrounding yourself with people that will um educate you well and support you in having that physiological birth, but ultimately understanding that God is sovereign. Um, and I, I talk a lot with women about why, why we have these opposing worldviews and how important they are when it comes to our labour and birth. So there is an idea among Christian women that we have been cursed. You know, Eve's curse is something I see a lot, Eve's curse, Eve's curse. But when we really look at Genesis 3, um, we see that God didn't curse Eve or Adam. He cursed the serpent and he cursed the ground. And I think that's a really good step in, in Christian women understanding that there is not a curse on them. They Adam and Eve were certainly disciplined, um, but there, there's not uh, Eve's curse. And we, we know in Revelation that the serpent and the ground are both destroyed. Those are the things that are cursed in Genesis. Those are things that we destroyed at the end. Mm, so good. Because, yeah, because Christian women have this kind of fear because we see some translations as well saying that um, God said to Eve that he was going to greatly multiply her pain. 
But when we really look at the Hebrew words used, we see that the word pain is actually sorrow. And the, the word childbirth, so her, her pain in childbirth is actually conception. So when we look at the, the words in the, in Hebrew, we see that he said he will greatly multiply her sorrow in conception, which is vastly different than her pain in childbirth. So her sorrow, we, we see that now because um, it's, it, it's not so much, it's not necessarily a physical pain. It can be a spiritual and emotional pain as well, or a sorrow. And her conception means that there is going to be roadblocks because of sin entering the world to her even getting pregnant. And we see that. We see problems in marriages. We see um, increased problems with like womb health. So she might have fibroids or cysts, endometriosis, other things like that. Um, we see couples struggling with infertility. So it's not that, that there was a curse on birth, that there, what it was was a multiplication of sorrow in the whole situation, in her conception. And because he uses the word multiply, we can assume that it was going to be a little bit of that anyway. He's multiplied it. So multiplying means that we weren't at zero. There was something there to be multiplied. So there's a real misconception about that verse. Um, and I think Christian women from that can sometimes fear birth and the, the perceived pain that's going to be there. So on the new age hand, on the other side of it, and this is a different worldview, and I think maybe this is why some Christian women are drawn to new age modalities, is the, Christ, the new age view is that we are amazing females that can create and bring forth life from our womb in our own power. And so we can control and dictate the, the, uh, our birthing experience. And like you and I both know, new age practices do work. <laughs> That's why we keep doing them because they do work. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a more of a feminist view. There is a more of a, I'm a powerful woman kind of view rather than I'm fearful of this. So just understanding those two worldviews, um, and if you, you misunderstand that, that verse in Genesis 3, uh, then you might be drawn to think, well, these women over here are having these ecstatic, pain-free pregnancy like births um but yes and i also see within christian um mothers there's the, on the flip side of that they say that eve was cursed but now the curse is is over well if that was true if we go back again to genesis 3 um he says that uh the woman's desires would be contrary to the husband we we still see that now with the rise of feminism so that's still in play we see that uh, the man will toil in labour to bring forth life from, from the earth. And we see that now. That's still, that's still happening. Um, it also says that, um, yeah, so, so women say that the, the curse has been broken by Jesus on the cross. And, and yes, his work has, is finished, and, and, but we still haven't seen the complete destruction of all these things. So if we were to say that the curse is broken and so women use this as a, and therefore I am declaring a pain-free birth because this is all broken and I have faith, that's another extreme where women that end up, a Christian that end up having a, a birth that includes pain can have their faith shaken by that kind of thinking. And so that's why I always say surrender all to God, bring it back to his sovereignty his ways are always higher. Women, whether it's pain-free or, or painful, all women experience pressure. It's how we perceive it that is what can vary. Um, but for myself, I had a very painful second stage, pushing my second baby out. And I actually, I see now and through witnessing many women give birth, it draws you closer. It can draw you closer to him. His ways are higher. And in that moment, that's maybe the experience he wanted you to have. And he understands why. And looking back on my life now and my first birth and then my second birth, it placed me in a better position to help women. And so you can see his plan throughout. Yeah. So I, it really pains me when I see women in my DMs that are I was. I thought that through faith I could have a pain-free birth and I ended up with this, that, and now I just don't know. And I think that can be really, really um, crushing to someone's faith. Mm -hmm. So surrender to God. <laughs> surrender to God. 
prayer is so powerful throughout having someone looking after you, um, even if it's just one member of your team that has the same worldview is, I think, really important that can that can pray with you. Um, we know the research shows that continuity of care with one known provider, whether that's your birth educator, your midwife, your doctor, your doula, uh, your, your sister, your auntie, whoever, it's just that one person there throughout all of it with you is going to make all your postnatal outcomes so much better. And then the other thing I always tell women is obviously we want to prepare for our labour and birth. We want to meditate on his word. We want to affirm his promises, um, his grace, his mercy, and um, affirm our ability to birth through him, not apart from him, not in our own power. Um, yeah, so those are the things that I kind of go off, go over with now with women um, and just, yeah, just understanding that you can have a birth plan but the best plan is to trust God's plan absolutely yeah. I think it just yeah. brings us in a very vulnerable spot to remember that we can't do anything through our own strength yeah. and that through reliance on him and him alone we can get through it mm -hmm. um, and yeah. it really is a beautiful opportunity to draw closer to God and um, mm. to deepen our level of trust with him. Yes. And that's absolutely what I experienced while I was in birth. Mm. Um, because prior to that, I had that new age belief that I could have a pain-free birth. If I just meditated, yes. I could have yes. an orgasmic birth. Even there's yes. that uh, belief yes. around there. I watched yes. some of those births and thinking that yes. that was a possibility. And yes. I very much had the opposite experience. It was the most painful um, experience of my life. It was really yeah. difficult and it drew me closer to God. And I'm really thankful yeah. for that, for that uh, experience and opportunity. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I love that you're speaking on that because mm -hmm. I really believe that a lot of these new age modalities are just slowly creeping in, even into yes. the hospital settings. And then so much. So, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's where we've arrived now where hypnosis is, um, offered as the free birth education class at the hospitals, all of the ones that are around me, um, that, yeah, all, all of these things are just offered. So um, it's just so prevalent and it's just considered so normal. Um, but, yeah, yeah, I, I love sharing what God has to say about birth. I love sharing all the, um, there's so many incidents where he talks about, um, makes an analogy between like, you know, labor pains is something, a theme we see a lot throughout the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, so again, that tells us that it, it, there's going to be some sort of pain as yes. well if he's using yes. it in that way. Um, but yeah, he, he's talking of, of like, uh, like I said, he, he's put things in there. There's um, without error. He wants mm -hmm. us to know those things. So mm -hmm. when he talks about midwives, he shares their name. There's always a deeper meaning to everything mm -hmm. in there. And when you, when you start looking for that theme of childbirth in the Bible and start looking at the birth workers in the Bible, you start to see the picture of how much God loves his daughters, which I just think is really beautiful. Mm. Yeah. That's incredible. Mm. So is there anything else you're being called to share before we close up here? Um. Yeah, I think I would just say, um, I mean, everything we've talked about is because the world is trying to convince women that, that birth is something to be feared and that motherhood is a burden. Mm. Um, and I, I know that the world does try to convince all women of that and then they try to peddle new age as the, as the solution. And that's why we see such a prevalence. That's why it's all so entwined. So, um, yeah, I'd encourage anyone listening, if you're having a baby, like I said, to, to have someone in your corner that has your worldview, um, to define terms all the time, just to see, gauge what people actually, what actually do, what they actually do think or what they mean by what they say. Um, yeah. And so I would also say that, um, you know, my, my Instagram page, I know I talk a lot about my new age and I, I do sometimes poke fun at myself and, and things that I used to believe but like I said earlier I have such a heart for those that are left the new age and um I, I would want to be an encouragement to women that that have left um and it's such a I think we, we all do it like I think I made a joke about it in my stories a couple of weeks ago about 
I've left the new age. I'd better start an Instagram page. <laughs> but it's so true. <laughs> you have this like urgency, like this, this, you know, it's just on your heart to try share because we we know what they're looking for. Mm-hmm. Um, I also, yeah, just um the power of prayer over your pregnancy, labor, and birth. I can't stress mm-hmm. that enough. I think Satan hates mothers and children. We see that again, it all goes back to Genesis 3, where God put enmity between the mother, the seed of the mother and the seed of the serpent. Mm -hmm. And um, we know Jesus will crush his head. But until then, it is a time where where we need to be prayerful and cover ourselves in prayer and have our husbands pray over us and everyone just to really keep it, and particularly in the postnatal Mm. postnatal um area Mm -hmm. i think uh, i've talked to many christian women where they just didn't they didn't think of that and postnatal is the most crucial point because um yeah those attacks will unfortunately happen for the pure reason that we are followers of christ and we are mothers and we bring forth more children made in god's image which of course puts us in his line of attack so Mm -hmm. um and i also just wanted to encourage anyone listening that has left the new age um, particularly those those that have lost friends, um, that have lost businesses. I really empathise with you. Um, and I know this road can be hard and lonely, but I also know that our reward is great. And so I just wanted to encourage to keep going and I'll just reach out if you want, if you want a little friend, an Instagram yes, friend. <laughs> yes, I will leave uh, Beck's yeah. Instagram in the show notes mm. because her... Uh, the way that she's able to create content around the new age and have a sense of humor about it too. (laughs) I love. So I always laugh when I watch your reels. I think that they're incredible. You have some really cool highlights on Mm. breaking down the misconceptions behind different practices like yoga and chakra Mm. balancing and the Mm. different aspects of labor that we talked about in the new age Mm. um, beliefs that are slowly creeping in. So I love that you go into the history and the origin of these practices and really put in the effort to educate people uh, because I think that so many of us just go into it blind, not actually looking into, okay, where did this actually come from? And that's what gets us into trouble. Yes. And I think looking at the roots is something that's so important. Um, The the Bible tells us that a good tree won't bear good fruit. And if the roots are bad, then we can assume that we're not going to get good fruit from that tree. So we can mark and avoid. Absolutely. yeah, Yeah. Amazing. Thank you, Beck, so much for being on. And again, definitely head over to her Instagram page and connect with her. She has great content. I know you'll love it. (laughs) Thanks.